So hi guys, it's Alex here again for Chess Factor and we're going to dive right into um, the first uh, big variation we'll examine, which is the classical variation against the Karo Khan. Uh, this takes place after the moves e4, c6, d4, d5. White has to do something about this undefended pawn. And so white puts his queen's knight either on c3 or on d2, defends the pawn on e4. Now, against either of these options, we're going to take the pawn on e4 here. White will now recapture with knight takes e4, and black here has a variety of options. We have the Karpov variation after knight d7, and we have two other variations after knight f6. If knight takes f6, e takes f6, this is the Tartikover or the Korchnoi variation, and if instead after uh, after knight takes f6 with check, black recaptures with the pawn, then this is the Bronstein variation. However, for this repertoire, although all of these moves are playable, and indeed I myself on a tournament, uh, in tournament games have played them all, I'm going to recommend the absolute main line, which is bishop to f5. This is a very natural move by black. Developing the bishop, one of the important things in the Karo Khan is that at some point, this pawn on e7 will probably be placed on e6 in order to allow development of the king side and eventual castling. However, you don't want to have your pawn on e6 and your pawn on c6 when your bishop is stuck within this pawn chain whenever possible. So it's very common in the Karo Khan that you will develop the bishop. In fact, this move is uh, what justifies the decision here to capture on e4. You make a concession in the center, but you do so in order that you, will, you force white to waste time with his, bishop, with his knight, and at the same time, you are able to develop your bishop because before there was a pawn here and it would have been impossible. Now white has two options. He can put the knight on g3 or he can put the knight on c5. If the knight goes to c5, this is quite a rare choice because black is doing okay if he knows how to react. The best way to react for black is simply to kick the knight away with the move b6 and after knight b3 continue his development with knight f6. The one thing that black has to be careful of in this line is that the pawn on c6 is a little bit weak so white can make a move such as knight f3 to e5 and at some point, put the pawn on g3, put the bishop on g2, and put pressure on c6. Black, however, will counter this plan with moves like knight to d7 early on, rook to c8, and even queen to c7. For the exact move orders on how to deal with this, you can actually check out the PGN file, which is uh, available uh, for all viewers, and this will explain to you how exactly you should react by uh, showing a game played between Magnus Carlsen and Peter Leko a number of years ago in this line. So let's go back. Therefore, the move knight c5, if black is prepared, is not, so, um, not such a big deal for black, so white usually puts the knight on g3 and asks the question of this bishop on f5. Black drops the bishop back, and now we're going to be examining the two main options for white here. The main option is to push the pawn on, onto h4, and with this move, white continues his harassment of the bishop. The threat from white is to play h5, after which there is no square for the bishop. So black needs to be able to uh, react against this. Before we examine h4, though, we're going to talk about the move knight to f3. This move sets up the threat, the potential threat of knight to e5, and also in some situations you will see the move pawn to h4. After knight f3, the main move that black uh, typically plays in this position is move knight d7. But we're actually going to recommend the move pawn to e6 here. So we will play the move pawn to e6, and the reason for this is because in this position, after h4, if we play h4, h6, knight f3, knight to d7, we don't actually want to play this line. Instead, we will be playing the move pawn to e6. 
Therefore, against the move order of first knight f3, we do not want to play knight d7, because here, after h4, we would be forced to play h6 to save our bishop, and we have been move order tricked into a variation that we don't want. In fact, what we want to do is basically against either first h4, h6, and then knight f3, we want to put our pawn on e6 and leave our knight on b8. And if instead white first plays knight f3, we will play e6 so that after h4, we can be back at the same position, leaving our knight on b8. Now, if we play like this, the one concern that we might have is that white can jump the knight to e5 and win our bishop. In general, we are taught as chess players after some point that we should try and avoid losing the bishop pair whenever possible. However, it turns out that in this case it's okay. Black can put his knight on d7, white can take the bishop on g6, and after pawn takes g6, black has a very solid position and also has a semi-open file here on h2, so it's going to be very difficult for white to castle kingside. Additionally, black will be able to break in the center very soon with a move like pawn to c5, and white's development is not so great. So overall, this is a perfectly uh, fine way to play as black. In fact, because of this, against the move knight to f3 and black plays the move pawn to e6, most of the time white does not even jump the knight to e5, but instead plays the move pawn to h4 and here black plays h6, and we're back into sort of the main line material that we're going to look at, which usually begins with the move pawn to h4, pawn to h6, knight to f3, and now pawn to e6. So this is a very important position for you to be aware of. Now, in this position, whichever way that you arrive at it, there are two major options that white can go for. The main option that we will consider is the scary looking knight e5. Because here, there's a big difference. White can actually capture this bishop, and let's say that it was white's move and he captured. We see that the black pawn structure is completely damaged. So this is really very, very bad because the light squares will be destroyed around the black king, and white will have the light squared bishop. Black will not have any light squared bishop, so really, the damage to the structure will be uh, extremely, extremely bad. After a move like bishop d3, I would say that the position would be lost for black. So, in such a situation, black absolutely must save his bishop with the move bishop to h7. However, before we look at this jump knight e5, let's take a look at what happens if the move pawn to h5. So after pawn to h5, black drops the bishop back, and white does something that he does very often in these positions. He plays bishop to d3 because black's best piece is this bishop. Remember, black has gone here, 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 and after spending all that time with his bishop, white says, I will exchange this very good piece on this very long diagonal. So after bishop d3, black has to capture queen takes d3, and knight f6. And here we see one of the big achievements for a Karo Khan player. Black may have spent a lot of time moving this bishop around, but for those of you, for example, who have played the French defense, you know that if you keep the bishop here and you put a pawn on e6, very often this bishop can become a passive piece and can give you a lot of uh, problems. For Karo Khan players, they're ambitious. They try to move the bishop out of the pawn chain, even if it takes a bunch of time, and then they figure, even if white has a little bit more space, we see this pawn on d4, I'm going to have gotten rid of my potentially worst piece, and sooner or later I'll develop my bishop, I'll develop my knight, maybe I'll even break through in the center and develop my knight via c6, and the position will be more or less uh, very solid and okay. For now, all I have is a little bit less space, but that's not such a big deal. So this is, um, generally speaking, how black plays. Now, in this position, white actually can do one of two different things. He can put the bishop on f4, 
or he can put the bishop on d2. Now, um, I won't show the complete lines in either one, but I want to show you a couple of key ideas um, across both of these options. So if white goes bishop f4, for example, black has this resource, queen a5 check. This is a very common move that black plays when the king is still on e1 and the bishop goes to f4. Now white drops back in order to uh, deal with the check and black plays bishop to b4. Now black threatens to exchange a bunch of pieces here. Now keep in mind white has a little bit more space and usually when white has more space and black has less space, the side with less space is happy to exchange pieces. So after bishop b4, white tends to play c3 to avoid exchanging pieces. The bishop can go back to e7 and now white grabs more space on c4, but the bishop just simply goes back to b4. And this forces an exchange of pieces on d2 and overall, let's say after move like a3, overall such a position is let's imagine this right here, tends to be quite uh, good for black because once again white has a little bit more space but on the other hand having pushed his pawn so far up the board they're a little bit more vulnerable than black's more compact pawn structure. So in fact the, mm, uh, the number of exchanges that black has achieved is a very big achievement and black's position is certainly not worse here because the space advantage may be in white's favor but the compact structure favors black. So this is one possibility. If you want to go into more depth, once again, you can check out the PGN file where I discuss these lines in a little bit more depth. Uh, so we just took a look at the move bishop to f4. What if white instead just develops normally with bishop d2? Well, in this case, after bishop d2, we see um, one of the kind of points of what we're recommending, which is knight keeping the knight on b8 rather than putting the knight on d7. Here, black will continue first with developing the king side, bishop e7, and now white castles queen side. White's idea is that he has this advanced pawn on h5 and he wants to storm the pawns up the board. But black, his idea is going to be to counter in the center quickly, following the principle in chess that a flank attack can be countered with a central uh, counter thrust or counter attack. This is usually a very effective strategy against attacks in the flank. So the game might continue short castle for black, king b1 just keeping the king safe before eventually moving the knight and pushing the pawn up the board. But here black because he hasn't committed his knight to d7 can push the pawn up the board c5 and undermine the white center. One sample line in uh, Grandmaster games has continued like this, knight e4, and now black ignores the threat against the pawn on c5, knight c6, white can take this pawn, although black is doing okay, knight takes f6 has been the main move, bishop takes f6, and white now takes this pawn on c5. White has grabbed the pawn, but now the queens are going to come off the board, and once the queens are off the board, white's attacking possibilities are not a big deal. This still leaves the question of how black is going to cope down a pawn. Well, let's take a look. Black plays rook to d8, attacking this weak pawn on d3. The bishop comes to e3, and black now plays rook to d5. Here, we begin to understand the compensation that black has for his pawn deficit. The pawn on c5 is attacked, the pawn on h5 is attacked, the pawn on d3 is attacked. The bishop is more active than white's bishop and the knight is a very good piece and certainly not worse than white's knight. The game can continue pawn to d4, rook f to d8, rook to d2. a5 is a useful move just to prevent uh, an advance on the queen side with b4 eventually. And here we can see that the d4 pawn is not going anywhere will be captured on the next move by black. Black has no way, uh, white rather, has no way of preventing the loss of the pawn because if he tries to defend again then the pawn on h5 will fall and 
there is nothing else that he can do because otherwise all of black's army is crashing down on the pawn on d4. Keep in mind if white had kept the pawn on d3 it wouldn't have been any better when black would have had ideas like knight b4 and similar doubling up on this weak pawn. So overall black is doing perfectly well in these lines with bishop to d2 or bishop to f4 that all arose out of this early h5 move. So before I had said that the h5 move is a serious option but our most serious option is that quick knight jump to e5. So let's set up that position on the board right now. All right, so we're back at this position where we just examined the move pawn to h5 and after bishop to h7, bishop d3, the bishops come off the board and then black simply continues his development when white has two options, either put the bishop on d2 or put the bishop on f4. And we saw how perhaps the most challenging option is bishop on d2, but black can counter in the center with a fast c5. And we saw that the complications are okay for black. Now let's examine the major option, which is knight to e5. This actually, well, there are some tricks and some things to know, but in fact, it's perhaps the simpler one of the two to deal with to react correctly as black. Black simply drops the bishop back to h7. It's very important to keep this bishop because taking back with the pawn would be a disaster for black. Bishop goes to h7 and now there's two moves uh, that we can consider. The same point, bishop to d3, that will be our main line. And also this tricky move, queen to h5, just primitive uh, threat of checkmate. What we need to know is that we cannot play a move like g6 because this would spell doom for our bishop on h7. So instead we play the move queen to c7, defending the pawn on f7. And well, white can create another threat with bishop to c4. The threat is to take the pawn on e6 because you could not capture back because of the pin. But black is in time to evict the queen from h5 with knight f6 and white has to waste a bunch of time developing uh, or rather moving the queen first from d1 to h5 now back to e2 black can simply continue to develop and slowly but surely black is getting out all of his pieces once again the key point for black is that this bishop if it were on c8 would be a very passive piece but now on h7 it's on a great diagonal and so strategically speaking black's position is very good the black knight will probably come out to d7 after black castles or black can first castle then play c5 and take advantage of the knight at not having committed to a square and put the knight on c6 instead. So therefore this idea of an early queen to h5 is really not a concern for black at all. Let's put the position back and let's consider bishop d3. The next thing that the black player needs to know here is that this pawn is definitely a poison pawn. If black takes the pawn, it's a very easy mistake to make because basically, uh, normally we know that you cannot take this pawn if, for example, there is a check, like bishop b5 check with a discovered attack on the queen. But in this position, we can see that there's no check. For example, if the pawn was missing, we could also check along this diagonal. But in this position, both diagonals appear to be closed. However, here is the, is the point. White actually has the move knight takes f7. Now, after king takes f7, the king now can actually be discovered checked with bishop to g6. And so the queen is lost. And if white, or rather if black, ignores this knight, the problem is that the rook is going to be captured on the next move. So... The complications and this specific variation, again, you can reference the PGN if you wish, but uh, just know that for now, this pawn stays on the board on d4. So instead, we play our usual reaction here, uh, which is to capture the bishop on d3. This is our usual reaction because really we don't want to leave these bishops like this, since if white can be the one to take, then we have to take back with the rook. Our rook is vulnerable exposed and awkward here on h7 and also we lose our ability to castle kingside. One of the nice things about these positions is that uh, black after capturing here, queen takes d3, black 
maintains flexibility as to which side he wishes to castle on. In this case, black, I'm recommending the move knight to d7 here for black, immediately targeting the knight on e5. And if it were black's move, he would capture the knight, and after pawn takes knight, he would exchange the queens, and once again, we would get a position like this, where black may have a little bit less space, but has succeeded in exchanging pieces, and these pawns are a bit weak, and black can even transfer his knight to a beautiful outpost here on d5. So overall, this is really not something that uh, white wishes to allow, and so he needs to do something about this knight on e5. The main move, there is also the possibility of bishop f4, but the main move is pawn to f4. And so this is the scariest move for us, and we should know how to react against it, and this will be the final thing to really know in this uh, variation. We start with the typical move bishop b4 check, which we've already seen in this video, provoking c3, provoking a weakness, and only now dropping the bishop back. Suddenly there are uh, ideas uh, centering around capturing on e5, and if white were to capture like this, because c3 has been played, the d3 square has been weakened, black could even take on e5 when white cannot recapture because the queen is lost. So white certainly has to be a little bit careful about these possibilities. So uh, after bishop to d6, white drops the queen back. It's a useful square here, no longer being x-rayed and undefended. And also the queen may be able to jump to g4 and harass on the king side. We're playing down a little bit of space, so we have to be careful. Also, we're being x-rayed by the queen here, so there are some tactical possibilities as we're about to see. But let's see how David Nabara, the longtime top number one Czech uh, player and one of the world's experts on the Karo Khan, Let's see how he played from the black side here. In this position here, David Nabara favored the move knight g to f6. We should realize why a natural move like queen c7 is maybe not ideal, because here white can play knight h5, striking at this pawn on g7, and in fact it's quite scary for black, because for example g6, uh, otherwise anything else like king f8 is maybe better, but it's not ideal to lose the right to castle. So if, on the other hand, you play g6, if white had to drop the knight back, life would be good for black. But in fact, white can give this nasty check here on g7, and if black goes to pick up the knight, now white can break free via takes e6, sacrificing a piece, and now knight takes g6. So far, black has two pawns for the piece, and he's also going to win more material here with this rook on h8, and the black king is very unsafe with no pawn cover. So we really don't want uh, to invite these kind of complications. And because of this, we should uh, follow the, the suggestion or follow the play of David Navarra and play knight f6. The nice thing about this move is that it covers the h5 square. And so if white plays like this, we can simply capture it. It does allow one possibility, which was played against David Navarra, which is knight f5. We cannot capture this knight because if we take it, there is a trick here. Knight takes c6 with a discovered attack on the king, discovered check, and the queen is lost. Therefore, in this position, black should deal with both threats and play bishop to f8, covering everything. Now white has nothing better than to continue his development with bishop to d2. Still black cannot take, but black can defend here queen c7, now black creates the threat of capturing the knight on f5, white now retreats this knight to e3, white can also retreat the knight back to g3, but now that the knight is gone, black can finally redevelop his bishop, and typically white castles queenside and black castles kingside, and we get a position like this where we have reached the middle game, and as black, we should be quite happy. We've achieved our main goals of developing this bishop and then even having the bishop come off the board for the strong white counterpart. And 
although we have a little bit less space, we plan to put pressure on White's central uh, structure here with the knight and the pawn by at some point breaking with the typical Karo Khan break of c5. The opposite uh, castled kings means that moves like c5 can also be complemented with moves like b5 and we will get some interesting dynamic attacking chess where by no means is the black attack both on the queen side and the black possibilities to break in the center by no means are they inferior uh, than white's possibilities on the king side. In the game against uh, David Nabara, white actually retreated the knight not to g3 but instead to e3 and this led to the e4 square being uh, uncontrolled because of the white queen no longer covering it so black jumped the knight to e4 and created with this a threat of knight to g3 forking the queen and the rook so uh, white must do something about this in the game, Navarra's opponent already went wrong with the move rook to h3. It was not the best move in the position. Instead, perhaps the best move in the position, at least in my opinion, is knight to f1, covering the g3 square and preparing that if black captures white's bishop, then uh, white can recapture with the knight and be very coordinated, have a little bit more space and be maybe a little bit better. In my opinion, therefore, uh, black shouldn't capture this bishop because... Well, at the end of the day, uh, the bishop with all of these central dark squared pawns is not such a strong piece and black can instead support his knight on e4 and I think that this position is approximately equal. The plans will be very similar again. White may wish to expand on the king's side and launch an attack, castling queen side, while for black he can either castle queen side or castle king side. He has the flexibility. He will develop his bishop either to e7 or more probably to d6 and he will also break in the center with c5. So this concludes the classical uh, variation and specifically the ideas that we'll be playing against it which is to play uh, this move an early e6 and um, avoid putting our queen's knight on d7 uh, in the majority of the variations. Oftentimes this will help us because we will play an early c5 and we will put the knight on c6 from where it will put more pressure on d4. So um, hopefully this has given you a little bit of a feeling for how to handle one of the more important uh, white options against the Karo Khan. Traditionally considered perhaps the best white option nowadays, that's not the case, but still a very serious try, the classical variation. Hope you've enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one.